I love talking about the shoulder because we can use the basic bowel mechanics behind it to identify exactly where the limitation is that someone has and the root cause of it. You may have heard me or someone else say in the past that shoulder health begins at the rib cage. And the reason for that is because this scapula right here is a rounded structure or a concave structure that sits on a convex rib cage. What that basically means is that this is a rounded structure that needs to sit on a rounded rib cage. The normal human spine curve has a degree of extension at the lumbar spine and then a little bit of rounding at the thoracic spine and then more extension at the cervical spine. So we need to have this degree of rounding right here so that the scapula can glide smoothly on that rib cage. If that's not in place first, then the humerus position is going to be thrown off, this arm bone right here. And it's going to be very hard for anything else to work efficiently because the root cause is usually somewhere in here first. A foundational concept within the shoulder is this idea of scapulohumeral rhythm, which is basically the integrated mechanics between the scapula and the humerus as the arm goes overhead. And we're gonna break those down in three main sections. The first one is going to be from zero to 60-ish degrees of humeral flexion. Humeral flexion just means how far overhead is your arm relative to your trunk position. So if this was zero degrees, this would be 60 degrees. Then we'll talk about 60 to about 120, and then we'll get beyond that afterwards. Let's start with zero to 60. So if this is the resting position, and then I raise my arm to about 60 degrees, not a whole lot is happening right here. You can feel it on yourself if you just raise your arm up a little bit. You don't feel much scapular movement because there really isn't much happening. What's really happening is that the humerus right here is moving into more external rotation. External rotation is this bone sliding forward as it goes up. Now, this is much more humeral movement than it is scapular movement. Therefore, we can call this humeral external rotation with relative scapular internal rotation because this is moving a lot, this is not. In terms of the relative position of this scapula to this humerus, we are in internal rotation here, external rotation here. Once we move to 60 to 120 degrees, which is about here to here, you can see what started to happen there. The scapula is going to progressively start to upwardly rotate, which means that especially after about 90 degrees right there, you can see it happen more and more, we are going to need to keep this scapula on the rib cage or else it's just going to fall off. So in order for us to do that, we have to use muscles that are going to externally rotate the scapula, meaning that it's going to do this to the scapula. This allows it to stay on the rib cage as it upwardly rotates, which is this action right here. That's why the serratus anterior is such a popular shoulder health muscle, because it is responsible for keeping the scapula on the rib cage. The fibers that attach on it allow it to do so. So as we move from this position right here of humeral external rotation, we are going to need to internally rotate as we get higher and higher. Now, this is really important because the humerus is going to move from external to internal rotation as that humeral head glides back. The scapula, therefore, is in relative external rotation as it upwardly rotates. So that's what's happening from 60 to 120 degrees. Once we get beyond 120 degrees, there's not a lot of room left for upward rotation of the scapula. So what needs to happen is that the scapula is going to posteriorly tilt to allow for this arm to get overhead, meaning that it is going to tilt back in this final range right here so that the arm can get overhead. This is coupled with more external rotation, but it's not that much relative to the amount of external rotation that the scapula is going to move into. Now this is more external rotation of the scapula, but what's gonna happen is that this humerus is going to need to go back into external rotation more than this scapula is going to further externally rotate. So you can refer to this as humeral external rotation with relative scapular internal rotation. But that doesn't mean that the scapula is internally rotating. This is just a relative position compared to the humeral position.
So hopefully that gives you an idea of these different ranges of shoulder flexion. Now we will come back to this, but I also want to break down the specific chambers or sections of the rib cage where we are going to start to identify these limitations. If you remember when I talked about the spine, there's the cervical vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae, and the lumbar vertebrae. We're going to be mostly concerned with what's happening within here because that's where we have this scapula sitting on the rib cage. There are going to be influences from below the scap, but we'll get to that in a second. Let's break down where these vertebrae are. The first thoracic vertebrae is right here, T1. T1 doesn't have a lot of movement relative to the rest of the thoracic vertebrae. So we're going to move and start this first chamber at T2 through T4, which is right here. This is running along the upper border of the scapula, the upper half of it. Right here is going to be involving the muscles primarily of the upper traps, the upper parts of the rhomboids, and also the levator scap. Now we can move down to the next one, which is T5 through T7, which is right in here. T5 through T7 runs at the lower part of our scapula. Muscles such as the lower parts of the rhomboids, the middle traps are going to be involved in this section of the rib cage. And then below that, you're going to have T8 and below the scapula. T8 is pretty much the last vertebrae that is in line with the scap. And then everything below that is going to be below the level of the scapula. And this is going to matter when we start to determine where these restrictions are. This is really important because when we inhale, we need to be able to expand our rib cage in all directions as the diaphragm drops and creates a pressure gradient change within our thorax as a whole. So what we should see is this circumferential expansion from front to back as the rib cage externally rotates. As we inhale, the rib cage is going to internally rotate. But if we have concentric orientation or tightness in certain sections of the rib cage, then air is a gas that's going to follow the path of least resistance. Let's say we had compression or tightness in this T5 through T7 range. That would mean we probably have tight rhomboids, mid traps, and other muscles associated in that area. Therefore, air is not going to want to go into that section of the rib cage, so it's going to want to go into the upper portion and then potentially even the belly. But let's say, and this is a lot of people, they have compression on both the front and back of their rib cage. An easy strategy would be to just push air into the belly, which would keep these ribs flared over time because we can just move these ribs out of the way. And now air is pushing us forward all the time. And this is potentially problematic because if we're only going forward, air is only pushing us forward, you can see how that would over time potentially feed in to a little bit of extension tone because that is the path of least resistance. So we can use these different assessments to understand what the limitation is. Sometimes it's on both sides, sometimes it's on one side. I cannot overstate just how important it is to get an accurate representation of what your range of motion is. Even though these tests might seem simple, there are intricacies to them. And I highly, highly recommend that you go check out the article I wrote alongside this and watch those videos. Watch those walkthrough videos in detail because if you get a misinterpretation of what your range of motion actually is, then that can lead to you not actually being able to solve a lot of issues because we'll be going after the wrong thing based on those assessments. That's why it's good to have multiple assessments that are checking for the same thing so we can get a pretty concrete answer of where we are. The first one is shoulder flexion, which is just scapulohumeral rhythm. You can use this assessment to determine and get a pretty good understanding of where someone is tight. But then we're going to cross-reference this with other tests to be very confident in where we are going to see these restrictions. So in shoulder flexion, remember how I said that at about 90 degrees, we start to upwardly rotate the scap more and more. So if we get stuck, and this is a lot of people at 90 degrees of shoulder flexion, what you'll often see is compression at that T8 region and below because we probably have extension tone pushing us like this, and this is obviously an exaggeration, but what that's going to do is compress this border of the scap at T8 against the rib cage, and it's going to prevent it from further upwardly rotating. So 90 degrees or less of shoulder flexion means that that scap can't begin to upwardly rotate very well. From 90 to about 120 degrees, that would be representative of 
compression at that T5 through T7 region. That's going to be mostly posterior compression, but you definitely can have influences at that sternal level right here because you can just imagine this if you were to round your shoulders forward and try to get your arm overhead because you have compression right here, it's not gonna feel very good. So this is a representation of compression at T5 through T7 if you get stuck between 90 or 120 degrees. Beyond 120 degrees, remember how we need to posteriorly tip that scapula. We will not be able to do that very well if we have compression at that T2 through T4 region right in here. Because the muscles that are going to be in this area have leverage to pull the scapula up. So if they're tight, this could prevent us from tipping that scap back and down. So if the shoulder flexion test was done accurately, then we probably have a pretty good idea of where the main restrictions are, but we definitely wanna check our work. So what we can also do is measure shoulder adduction. Shoulder adduction is a measurement of both anterior and posterior T2 through T4. So it's checking right here and also right here at the manubrial level. If we want to go at that T5 through T7 region, you can check humeral external rotation because external rotation based measurements are going to be more limited if we have compression on the backside of our rib cage. Anterior T5 through T7 restrictions right in here are going to be associated more with internal rotation of the humerus. Let me give you an example. Let's say we assess someone and they had about 100 degrees of shoulder flexion, so right about there. And they also had 50 degrees of shoulder internal rotation, but 40 degrees of shoulder external rotation. What that would represent mostly is compression at that T5 through T7 region. And because we're looking for about 90 degrees of shoulder external rotation, they had 40, that is going to verify that they have compression at that T5 through T7 region. And that would be the section of the rib cage we want to address for expansion. What we could do is get into a sideline or supine position, which both are great for expanding the backside of the rib cage, and we can reach overhead, over about 100 degrees. And you might be thinking, well, if you don't have the shoulder flexion to get to 100 and whatever degrees we'd be reaching at, then why would we go there? The answer is that because we are upwardly rotating the scap, even if it's not 100% genuine, we will be tightening things up all through T2 all the way down to T7. But because we're reaching over here, the lats have to let go to some extent to open up this space down here. So we might be compressing all the stuff through here, but it doesn't matter because the goal is to get here to expand. So that would be why we would reach overhead in that context. For T5 through T7, we have a couple of different options. We first need to determine, is it a posterior or anterior restriction? If it's posterior, what we can do is reach low in a position that's going to allow us to externally rotate the humerus, and that's going to allow us to move the scaps away from the spine. That's the goal with T5 through T7 expansion. Because if we have compression there, that means that it's pulling us together. We want to move the scaps somewhat away and abduct them so that way we can get some expansion going in here. A really effective tactic, which can be used to isolate one side, and I've touched in other videos, is using trunk rotation to help open up that space with a low reach on that side. The reason for that is because if I'm going to turn my trunk left, let's say I had compression at left T5 through T7 on the back side. If I turn this way, that's going to turn my spinous processes to the right, these little pointy things at the end of each vertebrae. If I reach low like this, this is going to move my scapula away from my spine. So I'm getting this trunk rotation right here, but also I'm reaching low, which is going to move that scapula away so I can isolate and maximize the expansion of this area. If we had restrictions on the front side at T5 through T7, what we could do is get in a prone position because that's going to allow us to expand that sternal area because again, gravity is going to push down on us to open up that space. It's just very, very important that when we do this, we aren't overly rounding our back. We need to imagine that there's a laser pointer coming out of our sternum and it's staying parallel with the floor because if we collapse this, we're just going to be compressing that area. 
we also would want to reach at 90 degrees in that position because if we remember that scapulohumeral rhythm concept, a 90 degree reach is in that 60 to 120 degree zone, which is a humeral internal rotation bias. Finally, let's talk about T2 through T4, this manubrial area right here, and also back here in this section. If we wanted to open that up, a low reaching angle is going to be great because that is going to eccentrically orient or elongate the tissues back here, such as those upper traps, to help create expansion there because the scap hasn't moved very much within that low reach. And we're also going to get a little bit, just a little bit of depression of the scapula, which is going to help further stretch that out. If the restrictions are here more so at that T2 through T4 area, going into humeral extension is a great way to do that. The reason why is because humeral extension is going to pull this back, which is going to downwardly rotate my scapula more and close off this space so we can maximize the opening of this space right here. Now I've given you a lot of different examples of ways you can target these restrictions, but it's so, so important that we know how to breathe through these positions. Because if we're not breathing properly, then nothing is going to stick in terms of our ability to expand our rib cage where we need it. So if you do want to breathe well, I have a video where I discuss that in detail, but the general idea is to take your hands and link them on your low ribs and then just gently exhale with a big open mouth as if you're sighing, and then you should feel your side abs engage. After you feel your side abs engage, you want to hold that tension just slightly and then inhale through your nose. That's going to keep your ribs down and expand your rib cage. So it looks something like this. And then you would do that for an extended period of time until you felt that, and then you would hold that as you inhale and you'll feel all that expansion in the rib cage. But the really important thing is that we are not trying to consciously turn on our abs. Our six pack needs to stay off because our six pack likes to really take over when our obliques and our side abs, our deep abs can't really secure the rib cage down for inhalation. So the only reason why we should feel any tension in our abs at all is because of the exhale, not because we're crunching, not because we are trying to turn them on. The exhale is what sets that. The best part is that you should be able to do one of these exercises and immediately retest your range of motion and see a significant improvement. If you didn't, then it's probably not the right exercise for you or the breathing wasn't right or the assessment wasn't right and it gave you the wrong idea because probably there was some compensations going on that you didn't catch. So I'd encourage you to film your assessments to make sure that you can have a before and after and also make sure that you're not unknowingly cheating the assessments. If you want more information, check out my biomechanics program. I also have a beginner version of it, which is going to go into much more detail regarding these concepts and has a lot more exercises.